Welcome to episode 17 of season two into the metaverse. Today's episode is said to be yet another fantastic conversation with one of the earliest builders and thought leader in the metaverse before the metaverse was even a thing or a concept and a vision that is now so cool and popular. Philip Rosdale is the founder and creator of Second Life, one of the earliest proto-metaverse gaming platform to exist. After leaving Second Life's developer Linden Labs in 2009, Philip started a new venture and since 2013 has been a co-founder at High Fidelity and built a new virtual world platform for emerging VR headsets. And at the beginning of 2022, the company is focusing on spatial audio technology, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. And then also in early 22, High Fidelity invested in Linden Labs. And so Philip rejoined Second Life as a strategic advisor. Philip, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Right. So, Philip, getting right to it, we have a favorite first question we would like to ask you as we ask all of our guests. And it actually kind of sets a really nice stage, no matter where people's background are. So as someone who has been building and working on and in virtual worlds for the better part of the last few decades, in your view, just what is the metaverse? And then also, not less important, what the metaverse is not? <laughs> Well, let's start with kind of one picture of what I think it is. And, and you're right, it's a good question. It's obviously a very, any word that comes out of science fiction that then becomes maybe a thing that we use to apply to things in the real world is interesting that way. When I, when people say metaverse, I think they're really talking about two big changes in technology and they're different changes. So let me separate them. The first one is kind of moving the experience that we think of as the internet today from being a two-dimensional experience on a flat screen with a web page and pictures and text to some kind of a three-dimensional experience like you know an art gallery becoming something that you walk around and look at the art as opposed to a bunch of art that you scroll through so the first thing is this 2d to 3d thing the second thing though that i think is the more important complicated dangerous impactful thing is making the internet a live experience you know, when you're on a website today, like Amazon or something, or, you know, a big news site, there are thousands of people on the site with you at the same time, but you can't see them or hear them. So I think the bigger change associated with the word metaverse is what if this big information space that we've had for 20, 30, you know, 40 years now becomes something that has other people in it? What would the rules be around that? How do those people get along? How do they identify themselves, you know? How does it work? So I think the bigger metaverse thing is making the internet live, making it have other people there. I think something important you just hit on, you kind of talked about it. The first way was the technology angle, 2D to 3D. And the second is more of the social aspect and kind of the social contracts of, of what happens in these, in these virtual worlds. And that's something that, right. you know, I want to dive into in a second, but I, I, I want to start with the technology. You know, we've talked a lot about the transition to real-time 3D everywhere with Mark Witten from Unity, with Mark Petit from, from Unreal, with Rev from NVIDIA, Omniverse, you know, all these people that are, they have a vested interest in real-time 3D going everywhere, but you know, at the same time, that seems to be the trend. Um, you've done a lot of work with VR as well during your career. Just curious your thoughts as well on the technology side in terms of the access technology, because a lot of people, when they think 3D and they think metaverse, they go straight to uh, Neil Stevenson, they go straight to Ready Player One. Does it need to be VR? Does it need to be something that, you know, a device on your face or is, or is it a broader definition in your view? Well, I hope that we can do things in the next few years that have a high degree of social impact that, that, that affect a lot of people's lives. And to your point, we're certainly not going to do that with uh, headsets on our faces. Uh, we're not even close to that being mainstream yet. We don't have a product yet. We don't have that iPhone moment, which is a product that everybody needs and wants and can unambiguously use, um, such as such as the iPhone was. Uh, and we are at least one or two hardware generations away from that. And then we're six or seven years away with the time that it takes for those devices to be purchased by everyone. So good point. I think the metaverse that matters is going to be the metaverse that's accessed over a smartphone. The only devices that are widespread, you know, human access points for the internet are now smartphones. And in fact, 
both Facebook and Second Life kind of missed that because we were, those are two companies that started, you know, around the same time in the early 2000s. And we didn't have the smartphone as a target at that time. So we built for 3D because of course we relied on the fact that we were using a laptop or a desktop that had a GPU. Um, but I think you're right. I, I, I think the metaverse impact that can be had in the next few years will have to be experiences delivered over a smartphone. And then if you go 10 years out, you can start to get to VR and AR, AR devices being a kind of a new access method. I, th I think that's that's really good to hear from you. And, and just that's kind of where Yon and I have been for a long time. I think if we wind the clock back, just you know, pr even 15 years ago, right when the iPhone came out, it would be so impossible to fathom that every single person on the planet pretty much would have a supercomputer in their pocket today. And here we are. And so, you know, if, if, if you're not thinking about the devices that are already there and you're thinking about devices that maybe will be there in 10 years, you're kind of missing the opportunity that's in front of you today. And you mentioned, you know, Facebook, I think that's a great example. I mean, they kind of saved themselves by buying Instagram, but they did miss the transition to mobile when that originally happened. And totally. And look at the attempts they made to catch up on it. I mean, it's a hard, it's a hard problem. In a big and, and definitely unlike the acquisitions of WhatsApp and, and Instagram, with all the scrutiny around Facebook today, it's going to become ever more difficult for them to acquire. I mean, look at what the, they are challenged now with buying a VR fitness app, basically, and they're being challenged. So imagine buying the next big frontier player that uh, can be relevant. But definitely don't want to spend too much time talking about Facebook and Meta because it's the less exciting thing, I think, for me that is happening. You made a really interesting point, which I think for our audience who listens, having the metaverse initially accessible through smartphones, at least for the foreseeable future, in your mind, and I know it's difficult to kind of project or, or predict, but in your mind, what do you think are going to be some of the key or core initial use cases for metaverse experiences that are, you know, live and in 3D that you think are going to be predominantly popular as a metaverse experience with these experiences being accessible initially through smartphones? Well, that is anybody's guess, first of all, let me say that's the right question. And I don't think anybody knows the answer to it. So that's a cool just point to, you know, meditate on there for a moment that, that, you know, providing social, uh, providing live experiences that are, ac you know, amongst people that are accessed over the smartphone is a, a, a tough lift. I mean, the question of how we're going to do that is a considerable one. That said, um, I thought during the time of Second Life, and I continue to think now that education of some of one education of different types in the sense that education is something that requires group interaction, live presence. Um, it requires a lot of different modalities of communication. It, it requires, you know, taking notes and talking at the same time, a lot of different stuff. But I think that when somebody gets uh, an educational experience right, and, and this, by the way, was foretold a little bit in the book, Ready Player One, not the film, but the book, uh, the idea that, you know, everybody went to school together in the metaverse. I, I think there is a real possibility there, um, even potentially on mobile devices uh, and certainly on laptops. Um, so I, I think if somebody gets education right, that would be a very important early use case and a very high impact one. And you know, Second Life is a bit of a study in that because there is a lot of educational stuff going on experimentally in Second Life. Although Second Life is a, you know, a city of a million people and not a billion. Um, Nevertheless, there are tons of classes, education, language learning, different experiences like that, that I think suggest that we're broadly going in the right direction. So I, I still expect education to be an early breakout. And, um, and, and what's, yeah. what's interesting about this as a use case also is who is the generation that is predominantly in schools and classrooms in education? It's young people, right? Below 18 and maybe even higher education, which is kind of in potentially the first metaverse native audience, right? Um, anywhere from, you know, a one year old to a, a 15, 16 year old. So um, a lot to a lot to think about when it comes to the education as a use case. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how it, I, one of the things I'm struck by that's fascinating about this whole metaverse scene is that at present, and you just you just said it, at present, all of the use of anything you might call a metaverse by the numbers is dominated by seven to 14 year old kids and nobody older. 
um, older people are not as yet jumping into the metaverse. Uh, and I think that says a lot. And I, and I think it's a very important observation to be made. And so I think everybody is looking at, well, you know, what are these kids going to want to do as they grow up? But I would, I would make a critical observation and I can say this, I have four kids. Um, so I, who are now, well, they, they range from 15 to 22. And so I've watched them go through all these products, go through Minecraft, go through Fortnite. Um, they've all, I had two boys and two girls, they've, they've all used them and they've used them in different ways, but they've all stopped using them right at about that age of um, maturation at about 14. And they're not coming back. They're not using them now. Uh, and so I think that's a very interesting observation. I think it may actually be that kids these days, younger kids, actually demand uh, a kind of authenticity to their avatars uh, once, once they're of adult age that is even more stringent than what, for example, the people using Second Life who are, who are predominantly older uh, uh, are willing to do. So I think we may actually go through a little, maybe it's like the Uncanny Valley where we have to figure out how to offer, say, 18-year-olds right now an experience that, again, we haven't technically demonstrated yet, or they'd be using it. And I, and I think they're even, in some ways, they're an even tougher audience than, say, people and that are 40. And it's really interesting because if you look at that avatar identity, which, at least in our belief here, is it's going to play an instrumental role in the emergence of the metaverse as people experience life virtually as avatars, who potentially are going to be no less important than our IRL identity. But you're right that at the moment, avatars on Fortnite or on Roblox or on Minecraft are very closely related to the age of the, of the audience, which is you know, primarily below 15. And then you have this whole different um, uh, field of NFTs and PFPs that I think you know, may be worth you know, spending a moment on, which are not 3D avatars that people experience in a 3D world, but there is a lot of emotional connection and people putting their PFPs on Twitter and so on and so forth. And so it feels like for the older demographics, and this is just an hypothesis, it could well start with a bit more primitive modality of an avatar identity until we get to a place where there is either better, more sophisticated ways to do that, and that the audience feels more comfortable to start representing themselves as a goofy avatar that maybe looks more higher end, higher end because Dior offers you skins and Adidas offer you skins and Nike offer you skins. And then, oh, actually, this is no longer weird. On Roblox, I may be weird if I'm 25 year old with an avatar. But here with all of these brands, maybe I can start experimenting a bit more. Yeah, I think there's a difference, as you say, there's a difference between the profile picture as an identifier, you know, which is what we've would like, I agree with you is kind of the, the gist of the NFT experience to some extent is that I that idea that you could have a uh, unique identifier that, that was itself then, you know, better credentialed by being attached to a blockchain. Um, but I think there's a difference between the profile picture you use, right, and the nature or the, the avatar, uh, the, the, the experience that you have when you're actually face-to-face -face talking to somebody. And I'd make another point about that, which is communicating with people you already know, like friends and family, we're all comfortable doing that just with audio, right? Why is that? We've, we've spent a lot of time on the science of that um, at High Fidelity. Um, audio works once you know somebody because your, your, your brain is imagining their face. So you're actually seeing their nonverbal cues because you're remembering them, so to speak. Um, you're, you're, you're seeing them talking. I'm seeing you nodding like you're nodding right now in my head. But if I've never met you, I don't know how you communicate nonverbally. And so it's a very different situation. So I think there's this distinction within the metaverse experiences. There's a distinction to be made between experiences that are for people I already know or perhaps coworkers, for example. Um, Discord, by the way, sometimes covers a lot of this ground, right? Because people get together in Discord groups. In many cases, they know each other, like my kids. They already know the people that are in the group. So it makes communication easier. Like audio alone, for example, just works great. But then if you want to bring it to uh, a situation where you're meeting strangers, you start wanting video. You start wanting uh, nonverbal expressions. You start wanting nodding, which I keep is a very important thing that we actually do as a way of kind of getting in sync with each other. Um, and so it's just an interesting distinction. Uh, and, and, and I'm saying that because 
the opportunity for human progress, the opportunity for a positive impact on society, certainly it means meeting strangers. You know, because if you're going to go to a political rally or a talk or a, a, a classroom for the first time, you're going to be meeting people that you didn't know before. And so we've got to figure out, we have to figure out how to make that. I mean, it's a fascinating topic. I know, Matt, you probably want to switch gear to one of the other items we wanted to cover, but I will call out, this is a fascinating, which is we a fascinating topic on the notion of what does it mean to be human in the metaverse and how do we build connection, socialization, human expression through avatars. But, you know, Philip, I think as you're calling out, and that could be a, a future conversation, what the role of audio in the metaverse is. Absolutely. We could spend hours talking about, you know, the, this, because I think it's extremely fascinating. But as Yon said, we, we, we do want to move on. Um, you know, I, I think before getting into the weeds of Second Life itself, um, you know, you mentioned Facebook in the beginning. Just something that I think you have some strong opinions about, because it kind of came up in, in the press release where you were going back to work with Second Life at Linden. Um, after high fidelity invested, um, you know, you, you had, you know, you had some comments about large technology companies getting involved in the metaverse. And I'm just going to read a quote right. from the press release for our audience who may not have seen it. No one has come close to building a virtual world like Second Life, says Second Life founder and high fidelity co-founder Philip Rosedale. Big tech giving away VR headsets and building a metaverse on their ad driven behavior modification platforms isn't going to create a magical single digital utopia for everyone. Second Life has managed to create both a positive and enriching experience for its residents with room for millions more to join and built a thriving subscription-based business at the same time. Virtual, world, virtual worlds don't need to be dystopias. So, I mean, those are, those are fighting words as they like to say, right? So, you know, just your overall thoughts on, as there's this huge influx of capital into the metaverse, and we've talked about this with Web3 also, how do you think about where we're heading and is this, and just, and just your overall thoughts about the negative externalities potentially of all this capital coming from such large companies. Well, there's a couple of th different things to unpack there. The, the first one is the ad business. And that one is one that I do talk about every time I get a chance and I'll do it here too. The, the problem with ads is not, of course, the old school banner ad or the uh, advertisement you see on the side of a bus. Um, that is a very different situation where the ads are not aware of you and so they can't be customized or changed based on what you're doing. When I complain about advertising as a business model, what I'm complaining about is the much more dangerous business model associated with YouTube, for example, of suggestions uh, or associated with Facebook group suggestions and in general the emerging market that we've seen around surveillance information, information gathered about people being used to target them with advertisements. We all thought that maybe it wouldn't be as bad of a problem as it's turned out to be. And, and it's because it's complicated. I've, I've read some very lucid descriptions of what happened in the last 20 years there. But the, the basic idea is this. If you go into a 3D world where you can track people and kind of change the world around them to advertise things to them, you enter into a very dangerous territory. And there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, you don't know where the advertisements are. When you don't know, in the real world, the advertisements are in a square box, the side of the bus, uh, that, that, you know, that square on the wall on the building on Times Square, uh, the magazine you're reading, right? You know that's where the ads are. In a virtual world where you're being advertised to optimally, you are not going to know where the ads are. The ad is going to be that person across the street who's sitting in a cafe sipping a coffee and the coffee's got a brand on it. That's going to be the ad. So you can't distinguish where the ads are coming from, one. The second thing that's super dangerous is that this surveillance information that can be gathered about you when it's a metaverse application and you're being watched by a camera or tracked by a headset is incredibly dangerous. I can tell things like whether you have ADHD trivially from your body movement in a, in a VR headset. I can tell what your level of arousal or interest is in things. If you, if you shift your eyes left and right, I can see that happening in the device. And so the com this combination of surveillance and the very idea of behavioral targeting as we've seen it historically, if you put those two things together, it's incredibly dangerous. And that's what we've seen with social media, obviously. And so we'll get to a world, we'll get to an, a metaverse that creates this toxic division and polarization in people that's worse than anything we've even seen before. The good news is you don't have to do it that way. And that's the demonstration that Second Life gives. Second Life, just like many of the NFT projects out there, Second Life charges fees for things. 
for digital assets in some cases and then for digital land in others. So when you when you buy land in Second Life and you own it and you're the person that gets to develop it and put stuff on it, you pay a fee, which is a monthly fee associated with the amount of land you have. So it's like $20 an acre a month in Second Life. And that's how the company makes money. And at the end of a year, the company makes more money per person using Second Life than Facebook and Google make uh, selling targeted advertisements, which is a pretty big deal. And I think that's a really important point to talk about in, you know, another topic we could spend lots and lots of time on, but, you know, just it is kind of crazy. And there's the whole political side of this and kind of the social geopolitical angle where, you know, you get into you get into rabbit holes where you kind of get these echo chambers and in the metaverse, you can envisage how that could be even worse. You know, we're trying to build inclusive metaverse spaces. We're going to talk about that on future episodes with some additional guests. But you know, we're, we're trying to make it so that way people don't feel like they're only, you know, they're being pigeonholed into a specific, you know, type. And that's kind of what these algorithmic advertising models do is they kind of say, okay, here's my thousand different things and you check these boxes. So this is what you get. You know, we're trying to build a more inclusive space. We're trying to make it so people can express themselves and really feel like themselves. Um, and so the whole business model, I agree with you, needs to kind of change. You know, we are seeing companies like Roblox, you know, potentially what Fortnite's doing as well. They're thinking about it, alternative ways to monetize. Uh, Second Life is doing it as well, as you mentioned. You know, I, I and I, I, I'm, I'm worried, personally worried about what Meta's metaverse actually looks like when, when it really reaches scale, when they bring it to the web and they try to monetize it outside of the VR headsets. Because to reach mass adoption, it has to be on the web, as we talked about. It can't be gated to a VR headset. But you know, they're a public company, they have to monetize it. The only way they know how to monetize stuff is with ads. And so there is a worrisome aspect to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you have a hammer, everything's a nail. I mean, the problem with problem with Facebook is it's the only business they've ever known. You know, when we started Second Life, there was no ad business on the internet. Sorry, there was banner ads. There was the web one version, but not the web two version. So we actually didn't even, we couldn't have done advertisements if we'd wanted to, because it just wasn't at all obvious that you could even make money that way, which is kind of funny in retrospect. I'd like to say that I was so prescient and so, so compassionate about people that I didn't want to hurt anyone. And that was true. I mean, I, I didn't want to hurt anyone. I wanted to help people, but we didn't even have the idea of behavioral ads. But but again, you know, Microsoft, Apple, uh, these are big companies and they don't make money. Yet. Yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> That's a whole nother conversation, but yeah, Apple yeah, yeah, is yeah, now building their own Apple, ad network. Right? Microsoft all, is too. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. we'll see where but all they got to a, about, they got yeah, to a north of a trillion see. dollar market cap without yeah. an I, advertising I, business. I think that's the piece. Exactly. Exactly. And I think Microsoft, if you look at all the stuff they're doing, it's kind of funny because in the 1990s, Microsoft was kind of the bad guys, you know, because they were, they were just, you know, invading every market and buying companies and, you know, doing what you see now being of a concern with Facebook. And it's funny that today, all these years later, Microsoft is like the good guys, you know, they're the ones who are just like, look, we're just building tools. We're not trying to manipulate you. Uh, you and and, you and Satya to, and Satya Nadella might be considered as one of the greatest, you know, CEOs of the century, right? At the end of this, at the end of the century. For the time, for the for the very brief time that I've spent with Satya, I, I found him to be extremely impressive. Uh, so I, so I switching like gears to talk a bit more uh, deeply on Second Life, and you know, I think there is a kind of two two pillar question that I want to to ask you, Philip. So, so first, just looking at some of the stats today on Second Life, um, the platform as of August 2nd um, had an average of about 40,000 concurrent users, over 65 million lifetime user signups, over 10 million visits to the website per month in the first half of 2022, all of which are, you know, fantastic numbers. <laughs> I mean, especially for a, a product and a service and a platform that has been around for 20 years. The two pillar question, the first one is, what was the original insight or the genesis of your insight that led you to bring something like Second Life to life? <laughs> no pun intended. And then, and then completely on the other side, what is it that after 20 years still brings people back to Second Life and makes it so special? Yeah, 
Yeah, well, thanks for giving those numbers. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think late, lately I, sort of, I, I was thinking about this the other day. There's a big difference between a billion-dollar valuation and a billion dollars in revenue. You know, and Second Life has, I think, at this point had the latter. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's yeah. a lot of value added. You know, like we're doing something for people because <laughs> otherwise they wouldn't pay us for 20 years. So, um, yeah, the, the dream that I had that originally led to Second Life was a couple of different things. I started programming computers when I was a kid, and the, the PC was around when I was a kid. So, you know, I'm like one half a generation or, you know, two thirds of a generation younger than, say, like Bill Gates. So for me, the PC was already there. The Internet wasn't. So when I was a little kid, I learned to program computers, but there was no big network yet. And I was very enamored of the idea of how you network these computers together. You know, maybe I was less, I, I was kind of a strange kid. I was quiet. I wasn't super, I wasn't actually super gregarious and social. And so certainly I think the idea of communicating online appealed to me in a, as it did to many people in a way that was special. Um, in my earliest days in computers though, I did a lot. I had an interest in physics and in programming. And I wandered into a lot of stuff that really blew my mind around how big the worlds inside computers might be. So things like cellular automata and the work of Stephen Wolfram. Um, I, I was programming that stuff as a kid. How, how birds fly. Uh, I have a tattoo on my arm, which is the basic rules of what's called flocking in birds that you can simulate on the computer, uh, you know, now in the Pixar movies. Um, so I was fascinated as a kid by the idea that the computers were going to become so fast that they'd be able to simulate reality and that you'd, you'd then be able to go into those simulated worlds and marvel at them. So that was kind of an initial experience. And then when the Internet came around, of course, I was like, wow, now you could actually connect together a ton of computers kind of on the server side to create a really big space and then just see what would emerge in that space. So that was you know, that was kind of the, the childhood dream that I had, uh, both, bo bo you know, both curiously and entrepreneurially. Um, it seemed to me that the coolest thing you could do with a computer would be to put a lot of them together and then get people in there and let them do something. And so everything about the initial design of Second Life, for example, its economy, um, was all just stuff to enable that, to enable people to be creative, to enable people to trade things with each other in the case of the economy, just to let them get in there and start building things. That's what I wanted to, what a, what a, to see. Go ahead, Matthew. I was going to say, I mean, that's, it's just fascinating to hear like the vision and, you know, fast forwarding 20 years and you see that it's actually come to life and it's kind of a vision that's also been adopted by others. You know, we, you know, we listened to, you know, executives at Roblox, we had Craig Donato on here, you know, they kind of share a similar vision, you know, they call it, Human um, you know, co-experience. Exact term, human co-experience. It's, it's based around. Totally. I was, I was like interaction. That's not right. The human co-experience platform. Yeah. You know, Fortnite. Tim Sweeney has a similar. You know, goal. You know, he's literally said everything in the company is metaverse. And so, you know, I, I think when you look at kind of these visionary companies that are building these next generation platforms, they share that vision around, and it starts with human social interaction. And I think that's that's the most powerful thing that I try to get across when I talk to people about the metaverse is forget technology for a second and just think about how humans like to interact with each other for the most part. And that is what's driving this. And then the technology follows, but it's a human social movement first. And, you know, along with that, you know, we're seeing these other platforms like Roblox and Fortnite, they're pushing deeper into live entertainment events like concerts and broadly IP activations inside the platforms. And I think that's really interesting tying back to the social concept because those are for fandom as a whole, that's a very emotional social experience. You go to concerts with your friends, you have an emotional bond with the artist. What is uh, Second Life doing around these, you know, trying to bring these brand activations and live events in? Because I think that's a very powerful way, as we talked about, to, you know, shift the monetization away from behavioral ads and find ways to that to monetize users that is, you know, kind of, it's just a better model, I think. <laughs> Well, you know, going back to live events, here, here's a fact about Second Life. If you think about there being, say, 50,000 people online right now in Second Life, you can ask a question, which is, is there anything common that they're, that a lot of them are doing, right? And I can tell you the answer to that. A lot of them are, are listening to live music right now, which is interesting. So people perform uh, for each other in Second Life 
and always have from the very beginning. So the idea of DJing at a club where people are dancing while they're talking to each other, that idea of live performance combined with, as you said, co-experiencing co things as humans uh, has been critical to the growth of Second Life from the very beginning. Um, I would point out, though, that there's a kind of a lean forward versus lean back difference here that I think is really interesting and important. You know, some video game experiences are kind of a lean back experience. Sometimes entertainment, you know, watching a movie is like that, right? You, you kind of disappear and you're just letting yourself be entertained. When I used to make the statement that Second Life was not a game, which I was just rewatching The Office, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Office uh, episode in which they had fun with Second Life and Dwight and Second Life. And it was just, just always makes me laugh to watch that. But um, when I said that Second Life was not a game, what I meant, I think, was mostly that, that, that the experience of having, of coexisting and co-creating and communicating with people is a lean forward experience. You know, you are trying to negotiate a relationship with somebody that you've just met or something like that, right? That, that experience is, a, is, a, is an engaged experience. Entertainment is sometimes, sometimes a lean back experience and things like live events can be a little bit of both. And so I think that's one of the things that's a bit confusing. Like sometimes people are sort of talking about ideas for a metaverse that are these largely kind of passive consumption ideas. And I think that's very different than these success stories like Roblox or Second Life or, or Fortnite Creative, right? Where the experience is a more people engaging with each other experience. So I think that's an important distinction to make. And it's potentially also a kind of a stumbling block as we move this stuff forward. You know, just taking a brand and rebroadcasting the brand into essentially a passive medium it's not going to generate that much use. I mean, it's not going to be that big a deal. The trick is to get people engaging with each other, say, while they're having that experience. So the live, the live, the live uh, concert experience is one where, and we talked about this earlier, you actually solve the problems of, hey, what would it be like to walk around in a live experience with 20,000 other people there and hear their voices and walk up to somebody and be like, that's so cool. Um, the, the kind of rules of engagement around that kind of socialization are the, the rules that we have to figure out and the systems we have to build to make this work. So Philip, I wanna... Oh, I'll go, okay, that was... Sorry, you, you go, you I probably wanna do a you comment go, on what Philip just said, and I wanna, I wanna move on to one more thing that is a bit on the more personal side. No, I, I was just going to say, I totally agree with like the whole lean forward aspect. It's something that I've been passionate about broadly about interactive and, you know, people try to, you know, when they, they lump entertainment together, I talk to investors, they lump entertainment. It's, there's so many hours in the day to consume entertainment. You can watch Netflix, you can play games. And I'm like, well, it's not true because I can throw on the office, which I've seen a gajillion times in the background while I'm doing the dishes that counts as consuming entertainment. That's not immersing myself in it. And I think what you're talking about this leaning forward and really not just kind of passively consuming, but actively consuming and being present socially is a huge part of what makes, what makes the metaverse stand out as, as different from what we've had in the past. And I think as we think about these experiences and, you know, the little Nas X Ro Roblox concert experience kind of was enlightening for me because that was an opportunity for people to interact with an artist in real time you know, that, 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 you know, in many cases you could never do before. And so I think these, these experiences where they're gamifying concerts, yes, but it's making it interactive and it's making it active and it's making you, as you said, lean forwards. And I just think that's kind of, that, that's what makes them so powerful. So Philip, Second Life is around 20 years old. Yep. You've got 15 to 20 year old, four kids, as you mentioned. You're now also focused on high fidelity, you know, being such an early builder in the space um, and we're still very early. So what are some of the things that really drive you these days with the work you do with both High Fidelity and with Linden Labs, as you look at this emerging frontier, getting closer and closer to reality, how do you think about the role you can play in that emergence and what, what are kind of things that really drive you to get engaged? Well, when you pull the camera all the way back for me, you know, when you look at things from the highest level, I am saddened and surprised by 
the last 10 years, like so many of the rest of us have been, that we've managed to use technology to cause harm. And it didn't feel like that in 1994. In the first phase of the internet, it felt like we were broadly doing good by, in most cases, kind of broadcasting information to more people that needed it, you know? The, the first phase of the internet was just kind of turning the lights on and getting it so that everybody could share and see information that they hadn't had before. The last 10 years, I think, has been a lot of different things, but one of the ways to put it has simply been that at some point that information becomes too much. That there's too much of it coming at you from too many directions, and there's a lot of sort of side effects that we didn't anticipate about that. So at a very high level, I am dedicating my time and my energy and myself to figuring out how to use, to, to go back to, in some sense, using technology for good um, and address some of the negative cases that we've had, like Facebook doing this targeted advertising, right? So at a, high, at a really high level, I want to do that with my time. And I'm thinking, I'm spending all my time lately thinking, uh, and I know a lot of other great entrepreneurs are doing the same thing, about how to do good and how we can use technology for good. Metaverse and virtual worlds can be a part of that if we do it right. But of course, they can also be, it could be terribly wrong too. Um, so I want, to, I want to help the industry. I'm involved in a ton of different groups and with different companies and advising and blah, 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 uh, trying to help uh, people that are doing virtual world related stuff do good. Um, I think there are ways to do good with, say, the smartphone. There are ways to do good with, say, um, looking at what people have been trying and wanting to do with things like NFT and crypto and asking the question, hey, how, how could we do something that was really empowering for a billion people or was a way of uh, doing money in a new way? I've been thinking a lot about things like that that are sort of maybe almost lower in the stack, if you will, than something like a you know, headset VR experience. But generally, I'm just looking for ways that I can use what I've learned. Well, that's a great, that's a great place to for, kind of, first of all, thank you so much, Billy, for taking the time. It's, it's been a pleasure. We've been waiting for this episode for, with anticipation to have a chat with you and delighted to hear about your mission and continuing to really use technology for good, which I think is, in a sense, what drives many entrepreneurs, not everyone, but many entrepreneurs to, to become entrepreneurs. And so we wish you all the luck on all of your endeavors. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Of course, for our listeners, you can find Philip on so many different places, if it's LinkedIn and Twitter and all of the initiatives that Philip is doing. And we'll add a few links to the Substack uh, for the episode once we go live. And so Philip, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real, a real pleasure.